Hello everybody and welcome. I'm Laura Hernandez, Marketing Manager at Nailted. And today I have the great pleasure to be accompanied by, by David McLeod. How are you, David? Welcome to this masterclass. Very good, thank you. Nice to be here. <laughs> so uh, David will talk about uh, how to improve employee engagement in increasingly demanding times. Isn't it, David? He did. Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> so he will deliver the masterclass for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A slot. So please take this chance, ask any question you have. Uh, you have the ask a question button below. Uh, so just ask, ask them as they come up, and we will answer them at the end of, of David's presentation. So, uh, for those of you who just joined, welcome to this masterclass. We are about to start. But before then, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about David so you can get to know him a bit better. So, David is co founder at Engage for Success. Uh, he co authored the book The Extra Mile on the topic of employee engagement. And he's also co author of Engaging for Success, more commonly known as the McLeod Report. And David was awarded an OBE for services to employee engagement and business in the Queen's Birthday Honours in June in 2013. So, David, if you are ready, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much, Laura, and good morning, everyone. It's uh, tremendous to have this opportunity to share something that um, I know many of you are passionate about and certainly I'm passionate about. And what we're going to be talking about this morning, as Laura's, uh, as Laura said, is uh, how do we keep people engaged through demanding times. Um, so we ought to really cover very briefly, remind us what is employee engagement, why it's important and getting more important, and why it's more challenging. There are also more opportunities, but why is it getting more challenging uh, to, to do this? But we'll spend most of the time on what to do about it, because that's <laughs> we've all got demanding jobs, uh, demanding customers, and we want to know how we make this thing happen in a practical way. So I'll spend most of the time talking about this through four lenses or four enablers that uh, enable you to improve uh, levels of employee engagement in your organization or lenses to look at the topic uh, through. So before we get going, let's just start at the very biggest picture on the, on this topic, the biggest background, the biggest context. Um, 19 million people since April this year have resigned from their jobs in America. And only 36% uh, of them didn't have jobs uh, to go to. Another report talks about 40% of people who are considering resigning. That's why it's called the great, uh, the great resignation. In a sense, this is an example of growing employee activism. People, employees, we have views. We want them to be listened to. We have requests for how we want to be treated. And if we don't see that happening, we're getting active, employee activism. We're speaking our minds, and then the ultimate, we're leaving and joining uh, other, uh, other organizations. So with that background, it's getting harder <laughs> to attract people. We've got to work harder at doing that, and we've got to work much harder at retaining people. And by the way, it's much cheaper to train people than it is to bring uh, new, people, new people in. And this is happening, it's not just happening in Europe and America. I was very struck by the, the South China Morning Post had just had an article about in China how workers value happiness uh, as well as there's more to life than just having jobs and particularly uh, the younger people uh, joining the workforce in China. It's happening right across the piece. The other thing that I think sets a very big context for this, because I know many of you are in the tech industry, often smaller organizations and growing and growing fast, um, is this problem of when you get to 50 employees. There's a kind of a glass ceiling because below 50 employees, give or take 50, below 50 employees, you have a hub and spoke model of leadership. You, you risk your career, you risk lots of money on starting your business. 
and you have a hub and spoke relationship with everybody. You know more about the customers, more about the products and services you offer, more about the history and so on, and you manage things from the center. When you get to give or take 50 employees, you can't do it that, may, that way anymore. You have to move from that to distributed leadership. And I was speaking to someone who said, a very successful business entrepreneur, he said the most difficult transition he ever made was that transition. Lots of organizations don't make it and stay stuck at 50 employees and, and their organization stays, stays small as a, uh, as a result of it. So um, we'll talk more about these issues uh, in a minute, but let's start at the very beginning. Let's just very briefly remind us about what we're actually talking about here uh, with, um, with employee engagement. There are lots and lots and lots of definitions of this. And that's not necessarily a problem because if you write something that speaks to your organization in your context, it's probably a good definition. But there is something that binds them together. And it's a very simple, but I believe powerful thought. There is in me, in you, in everyone, a level of capability and potential. If you put me in one situation, you get some of what I'm capable of offering this organization, and I develop to some extent. If, however, I'm in a better situation, in a better organization, you might get much more or maybe all of the capability I'm able to offer the organization, and I develop much further. And that sense of uh, offering my capability is what leads to people owning issues. If there's an opportunity to innovate, if I'm really engaged, I put the effort in to come up with the response to that opportunity to innovate. I come up with an opportunity. I take the opportunity to give better customer service, uh, to, uh, to open up new markets or to improve the efficiency with which we do things. Any four ways to improve business essentially and engaged employees have a pivotal role in taking those opportunities and give customer service to innovate, to open up new markets, to do what we do more efficiently. Engaged employees are the ones that take those opportunities and make it, ha and make it uh, happen. They own those issues. Now, if that's what it is, you might reasonably say what it is not. And I will now try and bring up a few slides uh, because the first one is a picture. And I think it says what well, it's not more easily than I can in anything else. So let's see whether we can do this. So give me for a second while we do it. Yeah. Uh, now we'll offer a slide. Uh, slide show. There we are. Uh, from the beginning. Right. right, well, I hope you can see this slide now of the tree on the ground, uh, which has uh, got a white line and somebody painted the white line has gone round that white line. <laughs> that is an example of an, of an employee who is not engaged. Um, I don't want to be uh, sexist, but I kind of assume it's uh, a man in a truck who sees the uh, sees the log and thinks they'll have to stop the truck, stop the white line, get out, move that heavy log, get back and blah, blah, blah. And he thinks, oh, sod it. I'll just go round that log. So they go round the log because it's easier. Now, more importantly at work, someone says to you, could we bring the meeting forward tomorrow? It would help me enormously by now. And you think, well, I probably could, but I have to ring everyone up. I might not get through to someone. I have to change the times of the meeting rooms. It's a lot of work. I'm terribly sorry. All our meeting rooms are booked up. Or more importantly, a customer says, can we change delivery days from, I don't know, Saturday to Friday or something? Because it would help us enormously. And you think, well, I probably could, but I'd have to stay late. I'd have to change the times. I'd have to go before the distribution group. I'd have to persuade them, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. We've got a new IT system. And... Uh, and I'm not able to do it at the moment. You know, engage, disengagement, not engaging people is when you get that kind of activity. In a slightly more benign way, but very important way, what example of what it's not is this. I don't know whether your organizations, you get everyone together 
back January to explain the strategy and the uh, Grand Fromage. They're on the they're on the podium, they're on the stage, explain to us in the audience what it is we uh, we need to do this year. And as they do that with a very well developed set of slides, what are we doing in the audience too often as we look at them? Can I suggest we are wishing these people on the podium luck because it's their plan, not my plan. Now, if that's the attitude, that is an example of, uh, of disengagement. So if it's about people offering more of their capability and potential, it's about people no, it's not about people going round opportunities to help colleagues or help customers or innovate and so on. You might ask, how important is this? And is it getting more or less important? This is a chart which we could easily spend an hour on, but we're going to spend five minutes on just highlighting some of the issues. Now, you see the orange line through the middle, 21st century. Above that line are some of the external pressures that are bearing down on organizations and people in organizations that everybody sees. And below that line, there are the attitudes, the increasing attitudes that our employees bring to the workplace. So if you take some of the issues above the line, uh, customers and citizens, we're a citizen of the public sector, are more demanding than they've ever been before. I mean, very interesting, the Institute of Customer Service here in the UK um, was charting what people want from their supplying organizations. And there was one thing that went from 19th some years ago to number two more recently, and it was this. Was the customer service representative I was dealing with nice to me? It's not enough just to give me the good old service that I thought I was buying and getting it right. I want to have a positive experience. Did you catch that quote from um, Michael O'Leary of Ryanair? He said, I think I get this exactly right. He said, um, if I'd realized being nice to customers would have increased payloads, I would have been nicer years ago. <laughs> so pressure to give a full smiling service. Changes in technology, the transparency that's now available through social media. I mean, there is a trip advisor of what it's like to work here that all, virtually all new recruits would be or should be going on to, to see what it's like to work in your organization. It's called uh, Glassdoor or Career Bliss, and there'll be new uh, versions of it uh, coming on, coming in in the, in the future that give us the opportunity to rate what it's like uh, to work here. We know what the supply chain ethics of our organizations are, or whether things are ethically sourced, we can rate everything, can't we? I was on a site the other day. You can rate light bulbs. <laughs> so all those external pressures and scrutiny and transparency are there. Then there's um, new competitors. I love this expression. Has your market been Ubered? Nothing is for certain anymore. Fantastic opportunities, but no one can sit still and think that they have uh, fantastic uh, walls around their competitive advantage. Um, I think it was PwC said it used to cost fifty thousand euros to launch a new um, a new company. Now it costs uh, uh, sorry, it used to cost twelve million to launch a new business. Now it costs fifty thousand to launch. It's hugely less because of uh, because of digital opportunities and with genetic medicine, AI coming into our customer relationship, and employee relationships. Um, Things are changing. The tectonic plates are changing. I was, someone showed me this the other day, quite interesting. You know, the world's largest taxi company owns no taxis. The world's largest uh, accommodation provider owns no buildings or real estate. The largest telephone companies have no telecom infrastructure and so on and so on. The world's in huge uh, flux. And we have to be agile, all of us in our organization, to cope with the opportunities and avoid the pitfalls. This is work from home. I mean, we've all experienced very different versions of what it's like working from home over the last couple of years. And McKinsey's did very interesting work to say that um, those employees who felt they'd be well managed through all this were four times more engaged and had six times better sense of well being. 
than those where they felt it hadn't been well handled. We have learned organizations have humanity in them. They have human beings in them. We thought organizations in the past were a network of transactions. They're also a social network. And if we get that wrong, employees, human beings bite, uh, bite back. So working from home, employee activism is a, a, a something around us. And then we look at it from the other way around. Look at um, how uh, employees expect uh, things to be much more open, much more diverse, much more inclusive. There's much less deference around. There was um, there was a, a partner in um, one of the big service companies. He'd been a partner for many, many years, and he was wheeled out every September to join the new graduates, have a glass of Chardonnay. And um, he said when he first went there, the new graduates look at the badge saying partner and say, oh, you're a partner. Oh, we just like to say how really deeply grateful we are for this opportunity to work for this great organization and how we intend to repay that confidence by blah, blah, blah. Now, he said, they come up to go, oh, you're a partner. Ah. We've been looking at the levels of diversity and there aren't nearly as many women as we think there should be. What are you doing about that? Um, our share in Asia Pacific is not the same as it is in Pan-Atlantic. Um, how are we going to address that uh, shortfall? He said, I now get grilled. <laughs> there is much less deference. Uh, people want to be empowered. You know, well-being comes from mastery, autonomy, Mastery, I feel competent and confident in what I do. Autonomy is I want to be empowered to bring myself to that role. And 50% of people want more of that. And I want a sense of purpose, which brings us to the meaning and purpose at work. I'm not a great one for management books, but but um, Senex start with why, short book, you read it in an airplane train, a couple of hours. Start with why, get the answer to the question why because it underpins everything fair and and fairness and trust there was a report recently that uh, seven out of ten people are neutral or do not trust their bosses so if you had a team of 10 and they were typical i'm sure they're not but if they were typical then seven of those 10 would be kind of mentally arms folded or actually mentally out of the door. That's what you naturally start with. The, 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 the trust paradigm, the trust deficit. So you have to work uh, to earn that, uh, earn that trust. So those are some, some issues about why the topic's getting uh, more important. Things are changing to encourage us to realize it's so important. The other reason is uh, this. If you, if you divide organizations into quartiles of levels of engagement. So top quartile are companies with the most engaged employees, second, third, and the bottom quartile for most engaged employees. And then you look at the business outcomes of those organizations. So this is a correlation, not a causality. But if you look at it and compare the top quartile to the bottom quartile on a number of dimensions, you get, for instance, these issues. Profit, twice as high. Customer satisfaction, 12% higher. Productivity, big gallop, uh, work, I think about 40,000 business units, 18% higher in the top quarter. Innovation, 59% of the more engaged say work brings out my most creative ideas. Do you know what it is for the bottom quarter? 3%. Well-being. Um, I read a report from the health and safety executive here in the UK that, and they called it a mental health crisis. More days are being lost through mental health issues than through physical sickness. Absence, about half uh, the number of the more engaged. Uh, regretted leavers reduced by 40%. Uh, the more engaged to the uh, less engaged, and it correlates with uh, health and safety as well. So <clears throat> there's some reasons why the topic is 
very important and getting more important because of these pressures, because of what our employees expect, and because it makes business sense, not only for the well-being of the employee, but it makes business sense for our organizations to address this topic. So let's move to the important part, which is uh, what are these four things that we need to have to engage our people? So the first one we called uh, is this. We need a simple story that everyone in the organization understands, what we call the strategic narrative, about where our organization started from, about where our organization is today, and about where our organization aspires to go in the future. Something simple, clear, and compelling. Something that, you know, the future, that something we get out of bed for, something we aspire to be a part of. Purpose is so incredibly important. In fact, Ernst and Young had 500 executives together and uh, around 80% uh, believe that meaning and pu purpose drives employee satisfaction, the ability to transform our organizations. In these organizations, the question why is asked and answered a lot. We work out together where we're trying to get to. But the reality is um, something like 72%, according to IBM, of employees say they don't really understand the strategy. I was with an organization the other day and I got them to uh, the top team to write down the three things they needed to be addressed needed to be addressed to get them to the future they wanted. Virtually none of those issues overlapped. They were all working in different kinds of uh, different kinds of uh, directions. And of course, for those of you from the tech industry where you're startups, if you're in the startup end of it all, you who are there at the beginning, you passionately know what you're trying to do. You put your maybe mortgaged your house to do this. You invested money to do this. You gave up corporate careers to do. You're clear what you're doing. But as you start to recruit people to your organization, do they understand? Do they get it the same way as you get it? Do they own it the same way as uh, same way as you as you own it? And often, if you're in the tech industry, the ecosystem that your product or servicing service is offering operating in is very complex. Do you really understand the future and your place in that? What are your competitive advantage is? Have you really worked at explaining that in a simple, clear way? Was it Drucker who said, if you can't explain to a six-year-old what it is you're trying to do, you don't know what you're trying to do. So um, getting this ownership of a future you aspire to, how do you do that? I was with an organization the other day. They were doing a very good job of this. The uh, most vast majority of, of their employees had one of these. So they asked them all to do a selfie video of about two, two and a half minutes explaining what they thought the future would be, the future they wanted to get to. And then they spent a few hundred euros getting a little editing packaging, turning that into a collage to bring alive what they were trying to do. And they were an organization called the Storytellers who go to organize, including banks and stuff, and get people to draw pictures of the past, where they are today and where they want to go into the, into the future. I know another organization did this picture, but they got everyone to draw pictures before they got into the strategy. And people drew pictures of the past with lots of deaths and bureaucracy. They drew pictures of the where they were, which was servicing customers in silos. And then they drew pictures of the future when the customer would come to them with a challenge and they would join up everything they could offer to help the customer deliver this challenge to make the organization stronger and better uh, for, the, uh, for the future. I know another organization in the distribution business, and they've got four people full time who go around all these distribution places talking in groups about why every job is important to delivering what they were trying to deliver. 
everyone from the floor cleaner through to the lorry truck drivers uh, through to the logistics people uh, everyone had an important role to deliver what it was we all wanted to deliver to give us the kind of organization we wanted to work in they worked at that uh, they worked at that together and getting this um, getting this uh, buy in getting people to uh, to really understand this and relate to this uh, at uh, an emotional level is incredible emotional commitment is four times more valuable than simple rational understanding daniel kahneman won the nobel prize for economics as a psychologist because what he said was what people emotionally feel is a much bigger driver of decision making than we like to think we like to think we all do the slow thinking where we decide what's important work it all out cost benefit blah, blah, blah. we most of us don't we have an emotional response and we need we want our people not to coerce them but we want them to be a part of this mission of our organization and when we get it at, at an emotional level uh then we're able to uh, manifest that and bring that to the workplace so we've got a story we understand we can hold in our heads it's not complicated and we could talk to anyone in a social situation about what we do for instance the um the next thing that um we found the next enabler uh, that we found is this we called it engaging managers we all work for someone yeah doesn't matter whether the newest and junior person or very senior ceo we'll work we all have somebody we're really responsible to we have a manager um there was a report a while ago in, that in america 62 percent of all employees would prefer a new boss to a pay rise <laughs> so the question is what are the uh, 38 percent uh, of managers doing who are broadly happy to work with or for. So there are three things. The first thing is this. These managers, they work with us about what success would look like. We're clear about what success would look like. They don't just work it out for themselves. And if they're new and junior, it might be success in three months. If they're very senior, it might be success in five years. But we also give them the scope to bring themselves to this job, to bring their ideas, uh, to invest themselves in it. And clearly, if they're new and junior, it might be more constrained scope. If they're very, very senior, slightly bigger scope. But whatever their seniority, whatever they're doing, being clear about what success would look like in the role and being able to bring themselves to it is important. As Gillian Stamp, a very impressive lady I've worked with many years, she calls about the tripod, the three T's. We trust our people. Uh, we tend our people. Uh, that is where we're, we make sure, you know, it's the shareholders' money or the public sector money that we're doing it. So we trust our people and we and we tend our people uh, to make sure that um, that they're uh, that they're doing what we need what we need to be doing. And we task our people clearly. The um and some I think I mentioned some 50% of people want to be uh, more empowered. Now the next one's this what are the worst two words in the management lex management lexicon in English, anyway, I think the worst two words are these: human resources. I'm not a human resource. I'm a human being. I am not a human capital. I'm an individual. If you treat me as employee four eight three that is how i will react i will do what you tell me to do because i have financial needs and so on but when your back's turned when you can't see me when you can't see what i'm dealing with day to day 
I won't own and deliver the opportunity to enhance our customer service, to suggest and champion new products that I see can have an opportunity, new products or services uh, in the marketplace. I won't take those things uh, and um, drive our organization forward. If, however, I feel I'm clocked as an individual, I have a bigger relationship with you. If I have a bigger relationship with you, you'll get more of my capability and my potential willingly offered to the organization. So how do you treat people as individuals when we're all incredibly busy uh, and we're very time poor? Well, there's a whole range of things at a practical level we can do. It might be something, for instance, at the childcare end. Can I come an hour later on Thursdays and stay an hour later? Maybe you can, uh, maybe you can't, but you have a conversation about it. I was talking to an Italian company whose shift patterns finished at six in the evening and lots were working parents who wanted to go home and therefore they produced, had delivered healthy takeaway meals so that they had didn't uh, it wasn't a scramble to provide food for the family in the in the in the evening um i was at ba systems they had uh, they factories right at the intersection near very near the intersection of motorways and uh and often those motorways were clogged up with traffic jams so they spent a few hundred euros buying a feed from the motorway camera right into the works canteen so when they finished their shift they could look and see whether the motorways were running clearly or not. And if they were, they go home by the motorway, which is quicker. If they weren't, they take they take the back roads. I was with uh, Mars, who were putting in lots of lots of uh, roof lights in the factory ceilings because people preferred light. You know, they were listening to what they were people talking about, and people often want to develop their careers. They sit down with people, these managers. They talk about what you want from your career, what you're looking for, how you can help people. Uh, land those careers that they're looking for. The best organizations offering people to go and spend a day or half a day in the department they might be interested in. If they're interested in joining the finance department, heaven knows why, but if they were, um, they can go and spend half a day a day and speak to managers. Round pegs and round holes is good for the employee and good for the organization. I was very struck by a small organization who uh, said, well, you know, people are very important. We want to treat them as individuals and um, we realized as we were recruiting new people, the first thing they got from us was a rather cold email or a brown envelope through the letterbox, which was very legal easy, very legal. It said, dear sir or madam, uh, we'd like you to sign this at the bottom to recognize that anything you come up with is ours, not yours. You will respect H and E's and blah, blah, blah. Very legal, hardly very motivating. You know, people start motivated and then all this stuff happens and they go. So they said, I'll tell you what, we're going to pay this person 35,000 euros um, a year. Why don't we invest another 15? So what they did was they sent these employees, these new employees, about um, a couple of weeks before they arrived, they sent them a bottle of wine and two glasses and said, we're so looking forward to seeing you. We'd like you to celebrate this with um, your partner or a friend. Have a glass of wine on us. And we just want to let you know that uh, we're all uh, looking forward very much to you joining us. And we're sorry, there is a, a letter at the back of this. There are some legal easy things you've got to sign. But overall, we want you to know how much we're looking forward to. And what is that employed? Good heavens, my new company sent me a bottle of wine to say they're looking forward to seeing me. They start bragging about this organization they've joined. They feel, they feel good about it. People want to be trained. It's so much cheaper to train people with new skills than is to bring people in. One organization was with said, look, we want our people to go on developing. So we'll give them a small sum of money to trade in anything, a hobby, because training develops the mind, makes people uh, sort of um, increases their capability. So they had this sense of it. They asked them what they were going to do, but they let them get on the, and do it because it was so important. The, uh, the growth of uh, self-managed teams is all a part of this. Self-managed teams are an important part of um, apparently building an aircraft carrier in the, in the Clyde. 
um, I was in a, um, an organization of a small factory. Their people, they thought they could bring in engineers for the redesign, but they designed 90% of it. It's also why big performance management systems are giving way to IDRs, which are individual development reviews, much less formal, much more frequent for people to be clocked for who they are. Now, some people say, well, in this environment, can you have targets? Yes, very engaged organizations have targets, but with one critical issue. They have targets to rejoice in progress. And if targets aren't being met, they don't blame, they investigate what was wrong. Was the target wrong? Was the training wrong? And some of the most profoundly successful organizations, you can't blame individuals. As Seaman said, we want everyone in our organization to feel like uh, to feel like winners. So yes, targets can be there, but if you view them as catching the laggards, the lazy people, you've got the wrong mindset. Now, the third thing that um, that these good managers do is this: they coach and they stretch their people uh, every, um, literally every week. Not a great formal. Here's a one-hour coaching session every Tuesday at nine o'clock. This is in the moment. Now, there are two lenses over which you might look at this coaching business. The first one is this. Now, for this lens, any Americans listening to this can tune out. This is basically something, in my experience, for non-Americans. This is about giving spontaneous, enthusiastic praise in the moment. Americans do that. I've lived and worked in America. Americans do that much better than other nations generally. You know, gee, that was a great thing you did yesterday. Thanks enormously for what you did by telling me the boss. Oh, you know, there's a great kind of acknowledgement for what people are doing. Americans have other problems, but on that, they're, they're, really, they're, they're really very, very, very good. And you know, big report, the Financial Times, 54% left organizations because they didn't feel valued. The Department for Labor said the biggest reason people leave jobs is because they're not appreciated. You have to appreciate people. It might make you uncomfortable, but you must do it. You know, um, this thing about our natural, our natural approach to this is uh, if something goes really, really well, and we've obviously got a comment on it. We're all in the room. It goes something like, well, that didn't go nearly as badly as I thought it was going to go. <laughs> That's not what this is about. Letting people know you really are enthusiastic. You ask your partner this evening whether they had a good day. And if the answer is yes, I bet you anything, it was something to do with being acknowledged, affirmed, recognized. Now there's the other issue. You will get the behaviors you walk past. Do not walk past dysfunctional behaviors. If you have a team and one of your team always arrives late and you are not seen to address that issue, what have you told the rest of the team? Start times for my meetings are entirely optional. I'm just delighted you turn up at all. More importantly, you have a team, team of 10, and one of them is not pulling their weight. One of them is disengaged from making a, a good and full contribution to the organization. Do not think for one minute you are the only person who sees that. Everyone knows who's putting the most into the organization. If you walk past that dysfunctional behavior, you have just said, again, you said to your team, thank you very much for anything you contribute. I'm delighted. You set the standards really low. You must address dysfunctional behavior. How you do it, though, is all important. I um. I think that um, having early in my career, I was um, 
I went through an assessment and my boss uh, said halfway through, he said, David, we've spent some time talking about your strengths. We're now going to talk about your lesser strengths. <laughs> well, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I address the lesser? He's on my side. He said, I got a career. I was doing fine. Here's a couple of things. So I did address those things. Now, exactly in that vein, find something. It's got to be authentic. You've got to believe this. Find something the person's doing well and then say, but here's something that undermines what you're, uh, undermines that. I know you don't think it's important to be on time, but it disrespects everyone else. I'm afraid, although it's not in naturally what you want to do, I need you here on time. Or the behavior of not pulling their weight, your reports are late or lots of mistakes or whatever. You address the behavior. You must address that behavior but through a positive uh, through a positive lens. And also, uh, so these engaging managers doing these three things, clear about what's expected, treating people as human beings, coaching people continuously, putting effort into this is incredible. There's a big McKinsey's report talking about co tech companies that many of you are saying they got more benefit from talent transformation from doing these things than they get from tech-based change. Getting this right underpins all the tech product and services you want to offer, enables those to happen. Get this right and you will do more for your organization often than just simply going for the individual tech improvements. And by the way, when you're in an organization gets and gets a bit bigger, don't forget, as it said in the report, the non-techie people. I was with a I was with a legal firm and they defined everyone as lawyers or non-lawyers. <laughs> You'd call that very motivating, would you? Lastly, um, so so let, let, let's go on to the next one with time's running along. The next uh the next lens or enabler we called employee voice. Now, employee voice travels. People's views and ideas travel. They travel from the front of the organization, sales and marketing, through to back office. They travel from the most junior to the most senior. Voice travels through the organization. The, um, uh, uh, it's uh, one of the most impressive leaders I ever came across said the job of the leader is to give the organization a damn good listening to. And that's where organization nailed it. Uh, there's no excuse for not knowing what your organization is thinking. The systems, the ability to find out what people are thinking is now there through uh, digitization, social media, and so on with systems such as nailed it in order to find out what people are, uh, people are thinking. And it's to find out not just all the good things, but all the problem things as, uh, as well. And you want that voice to be informed. You want to demonstrate your respect for voice. No one expects every idea to be followed up. It's perfectly reasonable to say we're not going to follow up on the idea for the following reason. You know, this sense, lots of organizations sending out communications around, you said, we did. So make i.e. make sure you do something with this employee voice, or better still, we said we did. Make sure people see it being being followed up. Communicate even when there's nothing to say, because nature abhors a vacuum. If you're not saying anything, people will start making it up. Make sure voice travels all the time. Harvard report recently: only three out of ten think opinions opinions count. Don't forget the lesson we have as human beings. If you want to ignore, if you want to diminish somebody, ignore them. If it's a party situation, a social situation, any situation you want to diminish, ignore them. And unfortunately, that's what we do in organizations. We ignore people. By ignore them, we diminish them. By diminishing, we don't get them off offering their capability and their uh, and their potential. And of course. Uh, through COVID, um, through COVID, there were three sorts of organizations. There were the classic old-fashioned command and control ones. There's still a lot of those around. 
There was those organizations that offered empathy, and that's not too bad. And then there were the winners, those offered empathy, and they did something about what they heard. They took actions. They were inclusive. The last thing is that um, this is uh, this is the cheapest smoke alarm you'll ever have. Yeah. Um, things go wrong in organizations all the time. They did. And I ran a global organization once through Europe. Things going wrong all the time. Do you catch them when they're little things going wrong or do you wait till you've gamed the emissions tests in North America? Do you wait till the oil is gushing in the Gulf? Or tragically, do you not listen to the voice that says it's too cold for the heat shield tiles on the Challenger space rocket to take off? And they all die. So employee voice is the way that you will catch problems when they're small. The final thing is what we call integrity, but it's quite a simple thought. Most organizations now have five or six values on the wall. They also have behaviors that are typical, that you expect to see amongst your colleagues and the bosses. The issue is, are those values reflected in the behaviors you see? Is there any say, do gap? If the values and the behaviors, the say and the do are different, the gap between them is called distrust and everything takes forever. If the values of the wall align with the behaviors, uh, then you get trust. And the values you get are by how you act. Let's try for a bit of fun, a little experiment that may or may not work, but hey, let's give it a go. Um, here's, <laughs> can you all put your hands in the air and can you create a circle with your thumb and your first finger? And can you put that circle on your chin? Now, when I've done this with live people, about half put the circle on their cheek, not on the chin, because that's what I did. What you do as leaders is what will, <laughs> what will set the tone, you know. So you're looking for trusting organizations. You have to concentrate ensuring you're giving behavioral leadership. Um, and don't forget, I think Druk is the most enduring management consultant of all time. He's now dead, but he said most of the things that's worth listening to. And he said, uh, don't forget, culture eats strategy for breakfast. If you're not trying to do things and you haven't got values and behaviors line, uh, uh, forget it. Innovation is the classic. We say we want to innovate. Probably the fourth out of five values is we want to innovate. Uh, and then uh, the behavior is as soon as someone innovates and doesn't work, they get a free one-way ticket to some uh, outlandish part of the world. And uh, and uh, that kills off innovation. So as we draw to a close, what we're saying is fairly simple. We want a story about where we've come from or where we're trying to get to. I want to work for a manager who treats me as a human being. I want my voice to count, not always to win the day, but I want my voice to count. Uh, and I want to work in a trusting organization with a sense of, of integrity. If we do those things, then we're far more likely to have more engaged employees. And I finish with this thought. We all know, don't we, that engagement, employee engagement is a term that's out there, but it's out there in two forms. Transaction engagement, which is not unhelpful, it's normally about a survey and targets set and so on. And uh, you can see improvements as a result. But the real benefit comes in the second group, transformational engagement. And if I say anything today that sticks with you, I suggest it might be this. Employee engagement, the attitude required to make it happen, is the thought that our employees are the solution to the problem, not the problem to be managed. If you have a competitive challenge, if your first thought is how do we get our employees together to decide what to do about it, you're in the right space. If the customer service needs to improve, if you need to even address cost, get your people together 
and ask them virtually or physically how we're going to address these issues. If your first thought is our people are the solution, uh, not the problem, then you set the underpinning attitude that will lead to high levels of employee engagement. So I hope I've said something that's of interest. Please feel free to go on to the website that we've delivered. We're not, we don't offer consultancy. We're just a group of people who believe this is important and want to share our belief. There are lots of case studies uh, and ideas to follow up, video clips and so on under www.engagementsuccess.org. I'm delighted to work with uh, Nailed It, an important part of ensuring employee voice works. And I hope uh, that uh, something I've said has been of practical um, practical help. So um, I think at this point we might turn off the um, turn off the slides uh, and hopefully go back to uh, the uh, the screen. Hi, David. Great masterclass. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I think uh, I can't speak by myself, but I think all the audience learned great best practices and methods to to improve our employee engagement in these yes. especially increasingly demanding times. So I can see that we have a few questions. So if you are ready, we can go yeah, yeah. We can go to answer them. So we have a first one from Julia and, and she says, hello, David, my question is, how do you convince your bosses about the importance of the topic? Um, well, it's a great question. I think I if, if someone, your boss is not particularly interested in employee engagement, don't go in and give them a lecture on employee engagement. You're not going to get anywhere. What you, what can I suggest? What you do is you speak to your boss and say, um, "What is it we need to do?" And they will say, "What we need to do is give better customer service. We need to innovate more. We need to move it." But look, they'll tell you what to do. To. Then you say, "Okay, um, right." So a lot of people will be involved in having to do that. Yeah, they will. We'll need the team on that. Are you convinced that everybody really gets the importance of this and really has got their back behind making it happen? The answer will almost certainly be no. Okay, so why don't we work together on how we ensure that everybody owns this issue that you think is so important uh, going forward? So reverse into employee engagement in delivering what a non-interested boss uh, is thinking about and thinks the organization needs. Talk with them about what it is they're trying to do. Um, and uh, and if they say, well, I'm not sure, then you could say, well, would it be an idea if I ask people what they're feeling about it all and then come back and we talk again and so on, so on. Build a conversation about what you're trying to do as an organization. Don't start um, jumping up and down and saying, why don't you get this thing I get? <laughs> Does that make sense? To me, a lot. <laughs> So I hope it makes sense for Julia as well. Yeah. We have a second That's one from, from Irene, and she asks, how can we build a strong strategic narrative in a software services company and offer the best environment possible when the day-to-day -day of our engineers is not fully under the company's control? So how do we, how do we build a strategic uh, narrative um, when some of the people who are delivering this are not fully under our control? Um, I suppose it depends a bit whether um, whether uh, they're actually in your organization or not. Although most people now have a supply chain where they're, they're trying to do this. And we make no mistake, it is it is a bit more difficult when they're not absolutely um, under your sort of control or within your organization. However, most decent suppliers want to understand what it is you're trying to do. So I do think that um, asking and involving people in the supply chain about what it is we're trying to do is uh, it, at, through social, through uh, through digital ways of doing that, sometimes physical ways of doing that, get them in the room talking about where it is we're trying to go. Now, if you've got engineers or scientists or uh, people who are highly technical, professors at university, whatever, often their loyalty is to that that function so one of the angles you've got to come at this from is you know do you want your engineering to have a big impact to have a big impact we'll need to ensure that our customers understand it that together we deliver it you, for your engineering to get the respect it deserves we need an organization a supply chain 
that will together enable your engineering uh, to uh, to make an effect in the marketplace and and therefore to be implemented. So let's get everybody together to make sure there's a common bond, a common understanding of what it is we're trying to do. So you can get people you get people to write stories about what they're trying to do. You get people simply to discuss it straight away. You can get people uh, to to do online post its and so on. Start to draw the themes together. As I say, I think I think although people sometimes not sure about it, but but that more emotionally based way of questioning. I was at an organisation the other day where we said let's draw pictures of where we are today, and the manufacturer head of manufacturing, big manufacturing baron said. I don't draw pictures. I'm very senior manufacturing now. <laughs> and eventually we prevailed upon him and he walked up to the to the chart and he drew a picture of head office. You could see it was head office. And out of all the top windows, he drew flames coming out. Now that said more about what he thought the state of the company was than any form of words. They, they communicated to sort of deeper level. So find out what's broadly acceptable words or pictures or little video clips but try and draw this draw this sense uh, of what it is we're doing draft out something fairly quickly send it out for comment and get people building towards what this thing is and then draw it and often the newest and junior employees will be better at this than the older ones often <laughs> you'll find the young i don't know why it is but they just have that ability to, uh, to draw this, make, bring this alive better than people have been there a while. This isn't a senior thing. This is ability to really capture the essence of our competitive advantage, the essence of what we want to do and bring it alive. I hope something there is of, uh, of a, bit, a bit of help. So we have a third question here from Javier, uh, and he wants to ask how does employee experience, employee well-being, and employee engagement overlap and complement each other? Well, Javier, um, the, the issue there is, um, I, I, think, I think it's this. Look, um, if we want to engage our people sustainably, as opposed to bribing them with big bonuses or threatening them, there needs to be employee well-being. If there's no well-being, if people feel bad about their organ, bad about themselves and bad about the organisation, you're not going to sustain employee engagement so employee engagement is sustained through the long term by having our people feeling a sense of well-being about themselves and about the organization and a sense of well-being very hard to get that unless the employee experience is a positive one so you have a positive point they have a positive employee experience you have a positive sense of well-being uh, and then you sustain your employee engagement Um, we also have a question from Nigel here in the chat, um, and he wants to uh, he wants to know what do you think is the role of IT tools in this? Uh, I think um, I think the, the, the Nigel the, the question of um, uh, of um, of the role of IT. If we think of IT or even digital opportunities as the solution, it's not going to be enough they are the servant of what we're trying to do when you introduce digital approaches or it based approaches uh, to doing this the evidence is very clear if you just plonk it in and say here it is it won't work you need to first talk to people about why we're offering this digital opportunity or this it based approach about the benefits of it, the potential problems of it, you get them to help to redesign it, you explain how it works. Those for whom we spent time explaining it all will get, uh, embrace it and get the benefit from it. Those who just say, this is wonderful package, off you go, uh, it doesn't work. Even to a point where I was speaking to organization, offices in Dublin, offices in London, they changed the working pattern uh, to make it, they thought better for employees, where they just dumped it in, it didn't work where they explained why they were doing it, what the parameters were, what was the expectation was, then it worked very, it worked really well. So um, uh, remember that IT is very important. It's a very great enabler of people speaking to each other uh, deeply, um, and when they're not actually there, it's a good way of sharing, 
data, good way of managing products, but uh, projects. But just remember that the underpinning why we're doing it, what we expect from it is a vital component of that IT being the servant of what you're trying to do. If it becomes the master of what you're trying to do, it doesn't typically work. Great, David, thank you so much. And if you allow me, I also have a question for you. Yeah. So uh, regarding this uh, remote work situation, how has working from home affected employee engagement? <clears throat> well, I mean, it's affected it quite profoundly. How For how long? We're slightly less certain. But basically, the good managers have become better and the poor managers have become worse. We all know the horror stories of people being working at home with no support, no involvement, no interest from the bosses. It's got worse. And we know the organizations where people feel pretty good about how their employers became much, leaders became far more visible than they'd been. They were there, they listened, they supported both practically and emotionally. They set up uh, often coaching for people who are feeling it, uh, feeling it was very difficult because some be very stressed by COVID, some less so. Um, they really did. Uh, they really did. That. So um, I think some of those things are um, are are, uh, are are things we've learned. We've learned about humanity at work. We've learned about the importance of uh, dealing with that. We've got the scars on our back. Or we've benefited from how we've dealt with it. Uh, and by and large, the best employers are now being flexible about how often to return to to the workplace and when. And the slightly more old-fashioned ones, unless it's unless you diff definitively need to be in the office for practical reasons, more old-fashioned employees are just ordering everyone back because they're frightened of losing control. Well, I would argue they never really had the control. What they want is engaged employees, so they get that by engaging them and allowing people to work a day or two at home uh, when they're doing individual tasks uh, is often m more productive than uh, the commute and there will be our times when they need to go into the office maybe two or three days so uh, getting it right for the organization having a dialogue about that is what we've learned needs to happen thank you so much for your for your answer david and once again thank you so much for for this master class it has been a great speech and to the audience thank you so much for joining us today in our third master class delivered by experts in in people and culture and now, if you want to take employee engagement to the next level, you can start today with, with Real Data by setting up your own native demo account. If you have any questions, you can, you can ask us everything you want to know, and you can use the link I just shared on the, on the chat. And also, you can follow us on social media because we are, we are creating more content. Uh, we will deliver it. There are more masterclasses, more guides and reports that uh, will help you will help you perform better and improve your employee engagement for sure. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, David. And thank you so much to the audience. See you next time. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening. Bye. Thank Bye. you.